Hello! This video is brought to you by my supporters on Patreon and my members over on YouTube. Minasan, san gozaimasu. I really, really appreciate your support. My name is Kurt, and this is my daily Good Life Meditation. It's an exercise that I do every morning, a little bit after waking up. It's now uh, 4.59 a.m. on the uh, 31st day of January 2024, day 319 of my retirement countdown. Day 59 for my wife. Yay! Wow, that looks good. Getting close. Um, I do this exercise every day to remember my life objectives and principles, those which are outlined in my book, Going Alone. You can get a copy if you want from the link down in the description. I also use the time to think about the last 24 hours and how I did with the challenges and opportunities that I met, particularly the ones that took me by surprise. I ready myself for the coming day, and then I prepare myself for death. But before I do any of that, I like to uh, read a poem, and I'm going to turn for, I think it's the fourth time, to try to read Edward Thomas's long poem, Wind and Mist. It's, it's a tough poem to read. Um, the, the reason it's hard is that I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a dialogue between two people. I don't know their gender. One of them is clearly, well, one of them clearly seems to be a man, probably Edward Thomas himself. Uh, and it, there's no way, clear way to distinguish when the one person and the other is talking. And I, after yesterday fumbling through the poem, I challenge myself to just study it, to try to discern that. I even thought about putting colors to, to discern it, but I realized that if I make a single mistake, then I ruined it for good in this book, because I plan to keep this book. This is one of the few things I'm going to take with me to Japan. This is going to be my poetry book to carry all around the country with me, or at least all around Shizuoka. So I'm just going to read it again, stumble through it, and if it sounds like it's one narration after another, and I bumble it all up, then so be it. Maybe... I don't know if that's what Thomas had in mind when he wrote it this way, without any clear distinction between when one person stopped and the other, because their wording is so poetic, it's hard to really tell. You know, it, it's not like there's no he said, then she said, and then thus and said, you know, that. <laughs> Let's give it a try. It's going to be my fourth, my fourth in, uh, attempt. Here we go. Oh, um, now I'm ready. Wind and Mist by Edward Thomas. There's a, a footnote here, and it's an indication, item number 45, back in the into the appendix here. There's a note here about uh, it's giving context. This is this poem is about a house that apparently the the Thomases owned that was a quite inhospitable place, not a comfortable place to live. I think they had it built. Um, and to give context to that, there's this note here at the back uh, in the appendix from uh, it's basically a quote from Helen Thomas, Edward Thomas's wife, commenting about the house. So let's read that before we read the poem, because it kind of helps to see what what a place this really was. <clears throat> Here's the words from Helen Thomas's uh, 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 her essays in World Without End. Somehow we could not love the house. The heavy oak was raw and new, and seemed to resent its servitude in beams and door, and with loud cracks would try to wrench itself free. There was nothing in that exposed position to protect us from the wind which roared and shrieked in the wide chimneys. Nor have I ever heard such furious rain as dashed vindictively against our windows. The fire of logs burning in the hearth seemed not to respond so much to our fostering care as to the wind which drew it up in great leaping flames and sent sheaves of sparks into the roaring darkness. Picture that, wow. Often a thick mist enveloped us, and the house seemed to be standing on the top of the world, with an infinity of white rolling vapor below it. There was no kindness or warmth or welcome about the house. Okay, so that's uh, Helen's impression of the house. Now let's hear Edward's uh, poem, Wind and Mist, relative to that, and keeping all that in mind. And isn't she a great writer? Wow. <clears throat> I tried to buy um, the, the, her book but yesterday, but it turns out it's out of, out of stock. I mean, I've got to limit myself anyway. I've got enough books to read for the rest of my life. <laughs> Wind and Mist. <clears throat> they met inside the gateway that gives the view a hollow land as fast as heaven. It is a pleasant day, sir, a very pleasant day, 
And what a view here, if you like angled fields of grass and grain bounded by oak and thorn. Here is a league. Had we a with Germany to play upon this board, it could not be more dear than April had, has made it with a smile. The fields beyond that league close in together and merge, even as our days into the past, into one wood that has a shining pane of water. Then the hills on the horizon, that is how I should make hills, had I to show one who would never see them what hills were like, Yes, sixty miles to South Downs at one glance. Sometimes a man feels proud of them as if he had just created them with one mighty thought. That house, though modern, could not be better planned for its position. I never liked the new house better. Could you tell me who lives in it? No one. Ah, and I was peopling all those ah. And I was peopling all those windows on the south with happy eyes, the terrace under them with happy feet. Girls. Sir, I know, I know, I have seen that house through mist look lovely as a castle in Spain, and airier, I have thought, twere happy there to live. And I have laughed at that because I lived there then. I extraordinary, yes, with my furniture and family, still in it, yeah, I knowing every nook of it and loving none and, in fact, hating it. Dear me, how could that be? But pardon me, no offense. Doubtless the house was not to blame, but the eye watching from those windows saw many a day, day after day, mist, mist, like chaos surging back and felt itself alone in all the world, marooned, alone. We lived in clouds on a cliff's edge, almost. You see, as if clouds went, the visible earth lay too far off beneath, and like a cloud. I did not know if I, if it was the earth I loved, until I tried to live there in the clouds. You had a garden, and the earth turned to cloud, of flint and clay, too. True, that was real enough. The flint was the one crop that never failed. The clay first broke my heart, and then my back and the back now heals not. There were other things, real too. In that room, at the gable, a child was born while the wind chilled a summer dawn. Never looked gray mind on a grayer one, never looked a gray mind on a grayer one than when the child's cry broke above the groans. I hoped that they were both spared. They were, ah, yes, but flint and clay and childbirth were too real this cloud castle I had forgot. The wind, pray do not let me get on to the wind. You would not understand about the wind. It is my subject, and compared with me, those who have always lived on the firm ground are quite unreal in this matter of the wind. There were whole days and nights when the wind and I, between us, shared the world, and the wind ruled, and I obeyed it, and forgot the mist. My past and the past of the world were in the wind. Now you may say that though you understand and feel for me, and so on, you yourself would find it different. You are all like that. If once you stand here free from wind and mist, I might as well be talking to wind and mist. You would believe the house agent's young man, who gives no heed to anything I say. Good morning, but one word I want to admit, that I would try the house once more if I could as I should like to try being young again. Just, damn, that's a good poem. And damn it, to me, I can't read it. I, that, the first time I read it was the best. It's lost a couple days back. I, it's actually recorded maybe three or four days prior. But uh, I, I keep... I knew it at the time, too. When I read it, I was like, that was, that was awful, but it was the best you're going to do, Kurt, because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Sometimes that's, that's, that, uh, that's a boon. Uh, I understand the poem better, not much better, increments better. I think I'm going to take that on as a challenge in the future to try to come back. Like I said, I'm going to carry this book with me. This is going to be my book of poetry to read. It's 
great stuff in there, good essays too. And it's just the right size to, to keep in the backpack for a, a read at the beach or at the park or in a Kisaten coffee shop or a, a Mamiangawa on a, on a rainy summer day. I gotta challenge myself to tease out that poem and get it right. Quite beautiful imagery, right? Anyway, carry on. Um, last night and yesterday, let's take a look at the checklist for yesterday. Busy day yesterday. Look at all that stuff. The work stuff, I completed it all. I, I, I didn't do this one of the day. I have to promote that to today. So on the work side, I didn't, I, did, I didn't, well, I did this story. I didn't complete the story. I need to work on that. I need the DDM workflow and the freeze the programs complete. Move that to today, and I've already done that. That's on today's list. On the personal side, and the way it works is the personal side looks like, wow, you're spending all your day on the personal stuff. No, these are all very quick items. A lot of them are routine. You can see that for today, the day hasn't even started in earnest, and I'm already, you know, four items in. So I'll knock most, I'll knock all of these things out in between before work starts, in my two 20 minute breaks at in the morning and the afternoon, my uh, half hour at lunch, and then I have an hour after I come back from the beach. Uh, that I can work uh, on these things. So that's when I do it. I don't let it interfere with my work. Good day yesterday. Good solid day. I got a lot done. Strange day too. Strange day. Why? I felt great. I guess that's strange. And I feel good now. Saw my doctor yesterday. He's like, He's like, what are you doing, Kurt? You look great. He just took all my vitals. He says, you're doing great. You know, the, the weight's good. He even he commented on my complexion. He said, <laughs> he said, he said you just look good. And I, um, I told him stress. Stress has uh, seriously begun to taper off as a result of the changes that I've made in my life, my, namely my decision to, to quit my job. <laughs> and my job, my current, the tasks they've given me are not as stressful as before. So that has had a cascading effect, a rippling effect on everything. I told him I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not waking up in the middle of the night. I wait a little bit, wake once in a while, very reasonable. But my, my pre-dawn and mm, awful, awful experience of waking two hours before the alarm goes off and sitting there fuming and fussing, that, that's over. Uh, I, f I feel better. Uh, what is it? Oh, my, my, the problem I had with my, my, my man parts went away. I had a, a two, uh, what were they called? Vasomeral. You know, it's like a testicular growth. I know it sounds gross, right? I was going to have surgery, but I decided not to and just live with it. <laughs> so gross. TMI. I don't know. <laughs> and the pain went away because the, the, I was worried. It, it was painful and that pain went away. Um, I still have the, Stingray thing in my foot. I didn't tell him about that because I think I thought he might suggest that I pull it out. Uh, just various and sundry other things. Just things are good. Now, I'm not saying that suddenly I'm young again. I'm not. I know, and I could go out in a moment. But uh, uh, resolving to end this particular way of life in due time. That's the thing. In due time. All right, I've completed my duties. Got my daughter to, to her end. And sure, I'm going to go out with some debt. I'll, I'll figure out a way to handle that. But um, but I got it. I made it to the end. Friggin' damn. I feel good about that. That's a big part of it. I did my friggin' duty. I did my duty to my to my family, to my daughter in particular. I, you know, I owed her her childhood, safe, stable, intact childhood, and uh, the bonus, the cherry on the top, was giving her her college degree without any debt at the end. Um, that feels really good. Now I can go into old age really feeling satisfied like I, I did my duty. I keep saying that, but that's how it feels. Now I can hang out at the beach reading Edward Thomas trying to understand that poem in peace. <laughs> There's nothing more to say about yesterday. Let's do the Good Life Creed. Um, oh, and one more thing to do. So there's five, set eight objectives, 34, five principles I'm going to talk about now, one called the Great Life Adventure.
The great life adventure is that centerpiece experience that we can have in our lives that becomes our story and uh, then is typically experienced in youth and then portioned out throughout the rest of our life as our part of our character and who we are and uh, uh, an intricate high point in the narrative of our lives. It's good to have a great life adventure in our early 20s, early to mid 20s, after university, uh, off preferably. Go have, you can, you can mix it in a little bit, but, uh, but go to university, finish that. That's very important, get your degree. That will open doors throughout your life. And even if it's not a career boost, at least it, it provides that basic experience of, of being in a challenging, um, uh, worldly, so to speak, environment, you know, broad environment being exposed to many things that we might not otherwise know in the course of our lives for a good number of years before setting out into the world and also being challenged to read, write, and communicate effectively, um, become good communicators, and again, broad, broaden our minds. After that's done, then to seek out and have an adventure of some sort. It can be anything you want. It should be something that, uh, of course, interests you, challenges you, and is big enough and broad enough to, to be fearful and to be something that you can have a chance to overcome. And maybe if you're lucky, <clears throat> it'll even break you. Those are the blessed ones, if they don't, if, at least if they don't die, right? Because it can kill you too. Although sometimes that's not so bad either. What a, what a way to end. <laughs> but um, they go out trying. But uh, if you can come, if you can be, if the image that I have in my mind is that we return, we, we, I have this picture in my mind, we come home from our last day at university, back home to our parents or our caregivers or whoever it is, right, whoever takes care of us, and we've got our degree in hand, and we say, and we give that to them, and we say, okay, here, thank you for this, thank you for helping me, supporting me, encouraging me through this, can you watch that for me, I'll be back by age 30, or whenever you want, right, but optimally give yourself the whole decade of the 20s. And then off you go. I don't, the details don't matter. Go out, experience the world. Hold off on the marriage, the family, the career, and everything like that until you've come back. Come back sometime in your late 20s, a couple of years later, maybe a, maybe a full five, six years out there. Optimally, if I was to do it again, I wouldn't plan to come back until I had crossed over my 30th birthday. And when you come back, you know, you're, your backpack is worn, your clothes are tattered, your your hair is bleached from the sun, and your skin is skin is, you know, is red or, or, or deep tan from the outdoor exposure. You've got uh, uh, you know some maybe a couple of interesting books in the backpack that you never would have known otherwise. You've got some names in your in your notebook uh, with contact information of people maybe in faraway places that you met along the way, and a brain chock full of stories of your great life adventure. And you come back and maybe if you're lucky, you're limping a little bit and you're humbled and you're a little more soft-spoken and quiet and a little more reticent to, uh, to, to extend yourself without first thinking about what you're about to do. A little more mature there, that is. Then you can receive back the degree. Then you can dust off any accumulated dust, prepare your resume, CV, I guess as they call it these days, and then start the process of building your career. Now, sure, you'll think, well, Kurt, my cohorts that graduated with me are already three, four, five, six years into their career. They're, they're no longer entry-level people. Now they're moving up the career ladder. I'm, I'm now I'm an entry-level employee. Um, that's true, and you'll probably be behind all your life, although you may have some exceptional cap capabilities and you may you know, leapfrog up to the, the wherever you want to be. But that said, you have something that is quite valuable. You have your story, your great life adventure. And that is going to be your bomb and uh, soothing element and your the thing that's going to make you an interesting person and a dynamic person, maybe more so than you would have otherwise been as you proceed. You will be the person that has a story. It has a a little bit of a smile on the edge, a little that smiles a little bit more than the feign thing that we sometimes give in the workplace to uh, keep up appearances. There's something genuine back there. You've satisfied some things. You also will not have missed the boat because you will have already sailed and come back. Sometimes when we start early 
and we have the want of desire and want and desire for an adventure and we don't give it to ourselves and we pine for it throughout our career lives especially as we grow in responsibilities and marry and have children and then you're really settled in you've got a mortgage and college tuitions to pay and etc cetera, etc cetera. you've got to postpone all of that and then maybe when you're all done you reach my age 60 years old, 65 years old, and it's time to retire at last. You're free. Your responsibilities are in their past. But you are no longer the person that you were. You're no longer young. You're no longer foolish. You're no longer wide-eyed. You're no longer full of energy. You're wiser, smarter, weaker, more timid, more cautious, and less likely to have a great life adventure in the spirit and to the depth that you would have had in your younger years. Now, you, now you're at the age where the type of adventure you might have is a safe and settled tour of Europe or maybe a, a princess cruise to Alaska with all the drinks included. Or maybe a, you'll get yourself a nice motorhome coach and you'll travel around your country going from safe place to safe place with hookups every night and neighbors all around just like you. They're retired too. They had their sane and so safe. They've got their safe places to go back to and their nice 401ks or pensions or essential social security draws. And they talk about their families, their children's, their careers. And they talk about the state of the world and how things have changed. You young people, they say, just aren't like we were. That's who you become if you wait. It's a lot harder to have the type of great life adventure that you might have had in mind post-college. It's not going to come back. You can't have it now. It's too late. You waited too long. It doesn't mean you can't have a good one. It's going to be different, though. It's going to be that thing that you are now, that, that experience that will come of being who you waited to become. Be careful. If you are one of us, one of our tribe, who desires such a thing, and there's not everybody's like this. There's a lot of people that have no interest in this type of stuff. But if you feel like you are one of us, and you're in your late teens, early 20s, I recommend mapping out a spot of time in your life, in your, in your 20s have one or more great life adventures to become your story and your your consequence of a deliberate life. All right, the eight objectives are to be always ready to die, to make good and effective use of time, to develop and maintain good and sound life principles, to cultivate good emotional reactions, to perform good actions, to recognize true limits and true opportunities, to do just one thing at a time and do that thing slowly and deliberately and carefully, and to uh, keep my balance. My 35 principles now are, here we go, war, reason, homunculus, anchor hold, home of good and evil, purpose, atomic principle, nature, pirate ride, maturity, social principle, family, public speaking, temperance, Life will not go well. The horror show, that which must be born. The feast of oval. Distraction. Agency and the great indifference. The best seat in the house. The, the restless man. The path of wildness. The great life adventure. The risk of avoiding risk. Sin and damnation. Complete oblivion. The season of philosophy. Script writing. Bullseye aim. Uphill climb. Arena utility. Nothing and enough. The principle of fun and being prepared. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Got them. You can uh, dive into any of these objectives and principles by reading the chapter titled The Good Life in my book, Going Alone. All right, so what am I going to do today? Mm, I kind of have my list all ready to go. It's just a standard work day. I've got like three meetings, um, a BDM process to complete, uh, go through my story stuff. The story is just the way I describe all the stuff, that how I manage the project. Uh, go through my email, and then I'm going to work on f contact Dan about freezing the programs. 
that'll pretty much be it for today. I'm going to work from home. Usually on Wednesdays I go into the office, but since I had the uh, two shots yesterday, I had the COVID booster and the um, shingles shot, and I was warned by my doctor, be ready, it might take you down. I think I'll work from home today. And then I have all the other stuff that I'm going to work on. Try to get to the beach this afternoon. A couple of days in a row I haven't gone. It was just too dang cold, so I'm disappointed in myself a little bit, but hey, it's my prerogative. <laughs> Okay, so that's that. Uh, am I ready to die? Are my three questions, are my affairs in order? Yeah. Are my relationships sound? Yes. Is my uh, life's work complete? Absolutely. My daughter's grown, almost graduated, has a job, and my book is done. There's nothing more to do. Just have fun. Carry my book around, my, my poetry book. Try to unravel beautiful poems. Think about things. Sit and listen to the quiet streams in Japan. Enjoy the, the rainstorm from being Gawa. Maybe get a part-time job, make them doing a little bit of stuff. Hopefully something I can speak Japanese and enjoy the rest of my life. I wish you all the best. Be safe, but not too safe. Take care. I will move forward and up. I will rarely stop, and I will never...